Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, here in New York City at Fifth Cloud Computing Expo. We've made it halfway through the day now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're following this power panel out there on the World Wide Web. This is our first ever lunchtime power panel. We wanted to see whether people would, you know, accept panels at lunch because there's so much stuff to get through that way. We're not eating into session time or general session time or keynote time. Seems to be a great success, so thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us out there. Introductions first, but we're going to make them extremely brisk because we don't have time for introductions. You can always see these guys at their stands. But I will tell you, you're allowed, please, gentlemen, just to quickly say who you are, starting with Brian. Hey, Brian Borup. I'm uh, the head of cloud computing and cybersecurity at CSC. David. And I'm David Markshevitz. I'm the CTO of a company, Navajo System, a startup company with SaaS security. That's the spirit. Jason. I'm Jason Lockhead. I'm CTO of hosting services at Terramark Worldwide. Ken. I'm Ken Owens. I'm VP of Security and Virtualization Technologies at Satus Communications. And Remco. I'm Remco Dober. I'm Cloud Architect for Nimsoft. Okay. So that's who we've got. But much more important is what's in their heads. And uh, let's try and get that out of their heads. So I'm going to start with a simple sort of factual question, like pop quiz. You're not going to have any difficulty with the answers. And if you do, they're going to shout from the audience, because they heard the same question this morning. How many years ago did Business Week run a cover? The title of which was simply Amazon's Risky Bet. How many years ago? Okay. Then secondary question, what was Amazon's Risky Bet? Amazon Web Services. So when was that? Five years ago. Yeah, okay. And then when came, what was the order? What came first, S3, EC2? Hmm. I think it was S3, wasn't it? S3. It was S3. Yeah. Where's Terramark when I'm asking these questions? No, it was, it was uh, that the order of cloud computing is already so far away that we can't remember it. That was really only my only point. It's already the deep, distant past. So it doesn't really matter any longer. So our panels tend to concentrate on the future. And uh, Brian, I'd like to start with you because you've come in CSC. You know, you're going to be talking to people what you say is going to be very, very, very influential as to where you think things are come from, where you think things are going, what you think the market wants. So if, I don't, if you don't mind my putting you in the hot seat, what's the single biggest change? I mean, we haven't had that much of 2010. And yet, 2010 seems to me to be different from all these other years, which we've now established quite a few years of cloud computing. What's different about 2010 for you? And if you gentlemen would think about the same, I might be asking you too. What's so different about 2010? So th there's two things that, that we're seeing that's really happened over the past 12 months. The first is um, who would have thunk mail is getting commoditized? Cloud mail and collaboration. So uh, Google, Microsoft, um, all the work that's being, um, that's being migrated uh, to the Google and to the Microsoft Cloud, more and more of the companies we're talking to are, are really active in this dialogue. The second thing that's really kind of transpired over the past 12 months is this notion of a private cloud. Uh, who would have thunk that over the past uh, 50 years CSC was doing private clouds? But it seems to be getting a lot of attention now in IT, particularly in uh, highly regulated industries like financial services, where companies are not interested in the public cloud, but they're highly interested in private cloud and SaaS enabling a lot of their internal IT and internal applications. All right, so those are the biggest, biggest changes. Who's got a view that's the least agreeing with Brian, that those are the least most important things that you're seeing because you've got some other important things? Well, you're just agreeing with him. Uh, no, I think, Jason um, thinks he's... You know, I think this is when we're gonna start to see whether or not the platform or the service architecture is the direction that enterprises are going to go, right? Because it's, uh, now you've got uh, a number of different choices out there from, you know, Microsoft Azure, Google App Engine, Engine Yard. Uh, there's a lot of them out there, um, and, but that requires people to, to have a new philosophy about how they write applications and deploy applications. So we're, we're going to see whether uh, people are willing to, to go that route and, and forego the traditional sort of client server architecture and development environment that, that they're used to and, and embrace this new sort of cloud development environment. Okay. Remco, what was your vision on all of this? Um, well, generally I agree. I think also that uh, we're finally starting to see that people are taking cloud serious as an option. So, and it's, serious, it's really starting to get momentum, whereas before uh, it was really a toy 
most of all, and people were doing development on clouds, but, but not really any production. And we're, we are starting to see some production now. David. I think that another thing that we start to see as people are starting to move into cloud is to see regulation uh, and con security concerns starting to appear more seriously because till now uh, it was more small businesses, mid-sized businesses. Now when enterprises start to move into the cloud, the regulations start to become more uh, effective and we st see more regulations regarding to the cloud. Right, which can't take us by surprise. What's the savvy's take in all of this? I think a lot of our customers are, you know, their business units are getting tired of waiting for IT to produce servers and to deliver their application stacks in a flexible manner. Okay. And so we're seeing a lot of a move towards, you know, not just infrastructure as a service, but how do I, you know, move my applications from where they're at to a cloud provider and move between cloud providers easily. How much of all of your gentlemen's time is spent dealing with the technology of cloud computing and how much of it is spent with other stuff, with process stuff, with human stuff, just to give the audience a sense. It's not really moving along in an abstract, is it? No. <laughs> not ahead, so expand on that. Yeah, so I, I probably spend, um, you know, obviously, when I, when I talk about my time, I spend probably 100 hours a week on this stuff. So. You know, I spend uh, probably 80% of my time on the technology and the right. process, which feeds into technology, and the other 20% talking to customers, going to visit customers, and understanding what needs and what business problems they're trying to solve. Is that what you're seeing in the field, Brian? Is that roughly? Yeah, it depends on uh, your business. So um, ISVs are beginning to embrace this cloud concept, and they're moving their on-premise software into a, a SaaS-type uh, deployment model. <clears throat> and it's fundamentally changing their business model. They have to learn how to reprice, they have to learn how to resell, right. what markets. Um, so in the ISV space, we see a tremendous amount of work on business process modeling. Um, and you know, in the enterprise space, uh, there's a lot of work that we're doing around processes to figure out what's core and non-core to an IT um, you know, CIO's workload. And the ones that are non-core, like mail, I mentioned how that's get, kind of getting commoditized and moving into a cloud model, we're finding that that business process is one that people are more likely to want to move into the cloud. And David, I mean, you're probably slightly different being a pure security play, but what are you seeing? So, yes, we're sitting in a different angle, but most of our interaction right now are SaaS providers that are facing regulation and security concerns. And what we are starting to see is that much more uh, uh, traction about security solutions because of regulation. So SaaS provider that in the past were less concerned about security because they consider their security infrastructure is, is enough are facing today regulation which says we don't care about your security solutions. They can be great, but we still from regulation perspective going to limit that unless we find other solutions. The EU privacy for is, is one example. We see it now with HIPAA, uh, the financial industry is going to follow. So this is something that become much more relevant to the SaaS providers. And the rest of you, if, if security isn't your sole concern, which it is for David, how much, again, this sort of rough rule of thumb, how much of all of this are you spending on that with customers? The security piece. Um, so I spend a lot of time with the bulk of my time with the software development team working on features and of those features I'd say probably uh, 30 to 40 percent of those are related to security somehow and so it's, it's a big else. chunk of the work right. that, that we have to do. Huh. Here's a question which is slightly different tag. <clears throat> it kind of comes from that notion of the law of unintended consequences so if the audience will just be a little forbearing this is the idea of I don't know um, one of the unintended consequences of the motor car was the one night stand. Because you could be in a motel and drive away. And you weren't in that community any longer. And that's what I'm told. I, I'm, I of course, too young to have experienced anything <laughs> like that. One of the, I don't know if anyone's done this, but one of the unintended consequences of, uh, of the net, you know, and of Facebook and whatever, I don't know if you've been reading stuff like this. Obviously, lots of things happen online, um, is apologies going back 35 years, 40 years, 45 years. I'm really sorry, I was the one who stole your gym kit in school and put it down the toilet. 
And it's been worrying me ever since. And you find them on Facebook. And apparently this is quite, quite common. And these people are meeting and finding, you know, they have children have to share interests in common. And it's all based on some horrible prank. I'm wondering whether, even after five years, has the cloud yet spawned anything that you're aware of that just might have taken us by surprise or taken you by surprise? This is a quirky question to see if we can <laughs> wake up the lunchtime power panel audience. <laughs> now, come on, think about your own lives and think about your business life. You didn't see everything. Come on, you're a prescient guy. Brian, what took you by surprise? I, I think um, I just did a, a session for uh, the senior high uh, class of uh, high school that my daughter goes to, to class at. And um, you remember the Michael Phelps scenario, right? Where he, somebody took a picture of him after um, a party smoking a bomb. What, what's caught me by surprise is the memory of the cloud. If you ever That's get, very good. if you like ever that. get, you know, it's not what you put into yeah. the cloud, it stays there forever, but it's what somebody else unintendedly captures a, a, a photo. There was a recent example in uh, Maryland where a guy was caught getting beaten by police. Somebody just happened to capture that on their digital phone, put it up in the cloud on the web, and people are now being prosecuted and thrown into jail for this. So there's that's perfect. Unintended consequences. Unintended consequences. People now scour Facebook before you get a job interview to make sure that there's no, you know, bad stuff, bad stuff going on. Unintended consequences. Come on. Try and trump that. That was a great one. The memory cloud memory. That's cloud that's memory. A, that's a, could be a whole real issue. Come along. See, hard to absolutely beat. not. Anyone in the audience, <laughs> I'm quite happy to come down and give you the microphone. Anyone in the audience can cap Brian's example, which is an incredibly good one. Yes, come along. Here we go, sir. Just uh, um, kind of add to uh, Brian's comments. Uh, I have two uh, young daughters, and they really don't know what a CD is. Everything they do, online games, Club Penguin, uh, all this other stuff they're involved with is all delivered from the cloud. There, there's no such thing as uh, getting a CD and loading a CD on your uh, local PC. So it's the death of the CD. Death of the CD. It's an unintended concert. Anyone else? Here we have. You see, I knew that you would be up for this. I have to follow on with that. I was watching TV with my daughter the other day, and she's nine. And she, um, I turned to her and I said, you know, when I was your age, there were only three channels on TV. She thought for a moment. She looked back at me and she said, Gosh, Dad, you must have been on the internet all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's ahead so far. <laughs> Anyone try and trump that one? Who would dare? Oh, no, but you see, you go right ahead, sir. My kids have a hard time understanding that on-demand TV is something that is, is not is new. I mean, they, they expect to watch their favorite show at any time of the day or night. This, the, the fact that there's a cable channel and there's a DVR and there's now Netflix on demand, you know, they only see the Netflix side. They don't, they don't understand why they have to w be at a certain time present to watch. It's just unintuitive for them. Time regulation. Yeah, on the same uh, note, uh, so my two-year-old niece, this is two-year-old, I was asking her what you're doing. She said, I'm watching a movie that dad just finished downloading off the web. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm starting to see a trend here because I get the same thing at home. My three-year-old asks me a question and if I say I don't know, she tells me to look it up on Google. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Look it up on Google. The, the prototypical cloud. Okay, we've exhausted that theme. It was just something I wanted to explore. I'll retrieve the microphone at some point. Just, just hang on to it. Okay, so that kind of raises something that, that has been happening, I find, recently, that one of the things that the cloud is doing, it's, and we've done it before with other cycles, but this more than ever, is you're all technology guys. I'm sorry you are all guys. We have a, more women speakers at this conference than in any conference I've run, and this is the 50th. So we've made some progress. I'm sorry it's not reflected in the panel. I don't know what happened. <laughs> But, uh, but there we are. But one of the things that I'm looking at is whether your sense, and we're all getting a little older, whether your sense of being technology guys, as well as your sense of being fathers and parents and members of the community, is the cloud helping perhaps to just fudge them a little more, to merge them a little more? And I'm noticing, so we're going to try this out, I'm noticing that, that is the case, that people, I'm, I'm getting more stories about three-year-olds and nine-year-olds and you wait, wait, my kids in college, 
that seem relevant to the use case or the business value of the cloud. And I like that. I welcome that. Um, with women, that's why I point that out. That's always been the case. That women in business use examples from home life just as readily as examples that men haven't done. So it is not a gender question, but are you seeing that, that blending of, of home and work somehow? It's okay to talk about it now. Definitely. Yeah, mobile devices got close device. because as they intruded into yeah. home life, we had to have that discussion. But I think the cloud is doing it. Yeah, so Skype, I'm wondering Skype anything around that. Skype has done a lot of that too with how you can have video conferencing. I, my brother lives in Hawaii, so we video conference all the time. Right. But how many people use Skype? Let's just, this is a, yeah, it is quite extraordinary. I mean, quite extraordinary. There was, I don't know, how many people here, which we had? We had CloudStorm here, we had Cloud this, Cloud that. How many people saw, um, yeah, cl it was CloudStorm, where they couldn't come from Europe, of course, because of the volcanic ash. And somebody's suggestion was just take a, a 50 laptops and let anybody in Europe just Skype in. Just 50 laptops in a sort of graceful arc. And I don't know, is there anyone there? Did they do it? Anyone go to CloudStorm? You see, it was yesterday, so maybe not. Yeah? Uh, 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 any arcs of laptops and talking heads well, from... Only, uh, let me give it to you. I'm interested. I didn't hear what happened. Hi. So there was only, uh, actually, uh, there were two presenters um, from Europe that couldn't make it. But uh, we, we're actually from Europe here. We're from Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't all that bad. And how the heck? <laughs> you swimmer, a strong swimmer, what happened? Well, uh, uh, first of all, we are, we are from a company called Green Cloud. Stand up and yeah. just show, ladies and gentlemen, these are our two Icelandic Hi. guests. Come along, don't be oh, shy. Well, there are four so of us, actually. It's, it's lunchtime. Well, you'll have to find them another day. A huge yeah, so, uh, Icelandic <laughs> specimen. So we, we, we joke about it. We are a, a new cloud provider. Uh, we're going <laughs> to do the first, uh, first green cloud in the world, yeah? So that was our alpha test last week, you saw. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oh, we, we got here because the, the wind direction was east. Uh, so there, the flights are going to Iceland now, if you want. They're going? Yeah, yeah sure. I might, now, that might have be been stopped. Yeah. Excellent. I'm going to Iceland next. So the unintended. I did think Cloud Expo and that damn volcanic thing. That was one of those strange, spooky coincidences, which I haven't talked about, so we'll... We'll press on hastily. Welcome to you. Um, how did we get onto that? Oh, because I was interested in Skype, yeah. So give me an example then of the cloud from, you don't have to give it, I don't want to pry, but just give me an example of the cloud in your personal life. Yeah, I do want to pry. Come on, something. Well, you know, my wife uh, stores all of our photos and movies on mobile me via the Mac so all the family can access them. And you know, it's, I don't even have to get involved anymore, right? It's just, she knows how to do all that stuff. I don't have to be involved. It's, it's actually pretty nice to yeah, come home and not have to do What about computer Brian's support. point, though, sort of m merging that with the unintended consequences? Again, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I probably am. Am I not right in thinking that I upload something to Facebook? Let's use that example. I think that's the most sort of dynamic one. I upload a photo to Facebook. Brian is in it. He knows Brian, so he tags him and labels him, yes? Got this so far so good? So Brian is now labeled on my site, but I didn't do it. Yes? Right. Now I'm out with my mistress. <laughs> See where I'm headed? <laughs> and I'm wondering. So now we're into privacy, you will gather. Sure, the expectation so, yeah. of privacy, right? Privacy, I, it, uh, that just takes me by surprise. I know, you know, as they handcuffed me or my, my wife assassinated me, I would say, but I, I didn't know. So what about that? I mean, in that instance, there must be an API facilitating so how does that slip under the barrier? They say, oh, yeah, whatever, we'll just throw it up there. They, if they don't like it, we'll do one of those press releases and get even more publicity as we remove it. But by then, the damage is done. And I believe to remove an image is also impossible. No, I don't once, know if that's right. Once there, you can't remove anything that has been uploaded to the cloud. Ah, it stays there for ah, Help, help, help. That cannot be right. So Please. come on, five of you. What, what are you going to do about that? That can't be right. I mean, that's got to stop. I upload to say, no, 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 make this stop right now. When, when, <laughs> this when is you, just too when horrible. You, when you sign up your Facebook yeah, yeah, yeah. privacy, Eula, Eula, you Eula. agree that yeah. none of that information is yours anymore. Yes, I, I well, and, and, you know, people can make and so legally, it's, it's really not your property anymore, which is why, 
you know, we are coaching a lot of high school uh, students to be very careful about the digital footprint Science. that they leave. Well, right, that's, you know, you and I have a problem with that and, and it, because it's a new thing for us. But once again, back to the kids, right, if they, as they grow up with this, you know, hopefully that becomes a part of their learning experience is, is <laughs> what you should and shouldn't share and what is your expectation of privacy. Well, there isn't any. But they have to be right. educated on that. Right. And right. Usually right now they are not educated. Yeah, no, right. And you know about an experience that I'm coming from the information security. So uh, my daughter, which is 10 years old, uh, has gone to a friend and has uh, signed in into, uh, I think, Gmail. And she was, uh, and her credential left on their computer and her friend got into that account and sent in her behalf emails that were insulting her. And uh, she came to me and says to me, it happens twice, and the first time I couldn't track who it was, but in the second time it was quite clear to me at least. Of course, it can't, you can't prove it to people that don't understand how it happens, but then she come aware to the fact that she has to be, uh, you know, keep secure her credentials and not log in from anywhere because it can be kept there. So once it happened to her, she become aware to that, but before, you can talk even to my wife about keeping their credential secure, and they don't get it. And, and once it happened, then they start to see, oh, we need to take it seriously. And what about the proliferation of credentials, right? It's how many accounts do you have out there? That's a different story, yeah. And how do you keep track of them and, and you know, make sure that if you're not using them, they're gone, or you know, you at least have good security on the ones you do use. Let, yep. let, me, let me try another tack on that. There's maybe it's a security thing, I don't know. So uh, obviously the mischievous thing was a joke, but I do have kids. And let's I mean, how many people have kids and they have, I'm gonna stick with Facebook. Just, how many people have kids and they have Facebook accounts? How many people themselves have Facebook accounts? How many people link to their kids on their Facebook accounts? Much fewer, right? So you probably share my view. I won't do it. I did it for my elder. I was 27 years old. I can, that's fine. I have a funny story about that, actually. Ah, yeah. now you come to it. <laughs> it's, it's, there's something here. No. Explore it. My, my son, his, his name is Ben, Ben Dober. He's 10 years old. And um, I looked him up on Facebook, and I connected to him. Yeah. And he had no picture, no private information, uh, not, nothing, just name and surname. And... Um, a couple of days later, I get an, a message on Facebook in Dutch. I'm Dutch originally. And it says, how nice you want to be friends. <laughs> and it turns out it was a different Ben Dober. Oh. But the funny oh. story. <laughs> but the Hi, Dad. <laughs> well. <laughs> but the funny story is actually that now he is connected to my entire family, to <laughs> my wife's entire family. He has about 50 friends now <laughs> who he doesn't even know. <laughs> Well, that's the law of unintended consequences. That's a good thing. No, I was curious because I was thinking that the, that thing of inadvertent consequences. So I had to explain to him, look, it's fine. I can see what you're thinking. But from my point of view, it's not fine. You know, you're my kids. And you know what? Just, I love you. You're my kids. And that's not something for other people to see where you spent the night. Or it's just not relevant. So I can't do it. I'd like to do it. I'd like to know where you've been. But... I can't. Well, in any case, I, I, when I was growing up uh, in Holland, uh, privacy was, uh, was a very treasured thing, and, uh, and we felt... That's a, good, that's a good word, treasured, yes. Yeah. That's, that's and we, we, we felt that, that the less everybody knows about you, the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm British, so I'm not so um, far from that. <laughs> and, um, but nowadays, in, in university in Holland, the same country, the same university, they teach now Google yourself into the world. Uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's a course. There's some merit to that, but I'm also an editor. So if you, uh, who, oh, ah, this is a difficult, difficult one. I won't look at your hand. Who, in manipulating their profile and editing their profile, really has edited it a little favorably, you know, towards it being a splendid thing? Come on, you can put up your hand because I know you did it. Yeah, it's an, an honest gentleman at the back, the only darn honest gentleman in the room. Do you want to share with us what the... No, no, better not. No, 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 it's fine. But so, in inverted commas, I know it's really a business conference, so the idea of the lunchtime power panel was to remind you that you're all people and that you are all people, and even I, that's an odd thing, are called by some people a person. Um, closing thoughts, the future. We always like to look hard edge at the future. We've just identified a five-year trajectory for cloud computing. 
we want to bet about the next five years. So most people think it's picking up speed. I'm not sure anything ever picks up speed. That's perhaps just the press cycles pick up speed. It's probably steady state, but, but nice steady state, you know, going up. So what should we be looking to? Brian, let's start with you. What should we be looking to? You've flagged up private cloud, so where are we going to see that? Um, you were talking about enterprise level, so where are we going to take that? Just, you know, let rip. So um, the, uh, the only debate is the rate. It's a little bit of a theme that we have. You know, is this going to happen over the next 10 years, 15, 8 months, whatever? <laughs> uh, it's, very, it's a very disruptive technology. And what's gonna, what I think is going to be very interesting is as these children and kids that we just talked about enter the workforce, how many oh, people yes. use Lotus Notes? <laughs> I don't want to say anything bad about it, but it's not like Facebook. Um, and I think as these people enter the workforce, they're going to expect collaboration and social media tools inside the enterprise that they have today in the, the consumer world. And that is going to be very transformational for IT organizations. They're going to they're going to have to change the way that they have these monolithic you know, email systems. In fact, email probably, the reason it's getting commoditized, is it's probably going to get supplanted by social, social media and, and unified communication and Skype. Yeah. I think that's going to be very disruptive uh, to the IT space. That's a pretty good start. The end of email, not bad, within five years. And I think you're right. David? Uh, I think from a security perspective, the whole issue of identity management, how you manage your identity, especially in the world, we mentioned the fact that you have many accounts, many credentials, very hard to manage them. Uh, so we would see some consolidation in that aspect. It's very hard to know what technology would took up because there was different trends and it usually from the past very hard to guess what trend will take off. Um, so you know, there's been a lot of talk about you know moving workloads back and forth from my premise to the cloud, you know, into a cloud provider's uh, cloud. Uh, I think there's going to be some of that, but I think people are going to discover it's more challenging than it sounds at first. Uh, particularly the way applications are built, it goes back to this client-server centralized data, uh, things being tied together, coupled together very tightly, makes it difficult to move that stuff. So I think that's what's going to drive people changing the way they architect their applications and writing applications that are designed to work in the cloud where latency doesn't matter so much, where your, you know, where your data lives doesn't matter so much. So. Okay. That's Jason's take, Ken? I think from a, a policy and governance standpoint, you're going to see enterprises wanting to, to put more security controls around their applications, how you put the applications together, and classifications of different types of cloud. So today, you know, enterprises have a lot of data classification for their own data. I think you're going to see cloud providers try to offer data classifications for their clouds. What type of applications run best in this cloud versus another cloud? Oh, okay, that's intriguing. Remco? Well, I think it's very clear that uh, the uh, business uh, advantages of cloud are, uh, are overwhelming. And, um, and the challenges are probably around security, reliability, um, management uh, headaches. And as we, as we mature the tools, to, um, to, to enable you to monitor cloud, to make the cloud more secure, those challenges are going to get less. And the business, the business benefits are only going up. It's resource pooling, right? So well. we're all going to the cloud. Thank you for sharing. Let's give it up for collectively Brian Borrow from CSC, David <laughs> Movakovic from Navajo Systems, Jason Lockhead from Terramark, Ken Owens from Savis, and last but not least, Remco Dobber from Nimsoft. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, um, audience. And uh, on to the next session, which is in this room, Tony Bishop, Adaptivity. We just